Good morning, church. Welcome to fellowship. Let's stand together. Let's worship together. Let's turn our attention to our Father. Let him know all the battles that we face. He's going to win. Amen. Let's sing this together. There's peace that outlasts darkness. Hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow, for tomorrow's in your hands. All I need you will provide, just like you always have. I'm fighting.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song Psalm 57, together, out loud. This is our prayer. This 
is why we meet together for just an hour while we're here together, every mind, every heart, every spirit focused on our Father, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's read these words. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth.
Amen. Man, that was good, huh? Praise the Lord. It's good to be in church, isn't it? I'm so grateful that you're here and uh, excited for an opportunity to be able to worship. That is, that's what it's all about. He is worthy, and I'm so glad that you've taken the time to be here today. Now, if you haven't checked in for worship, that's a way that we can uh, communicate, find out what's going on in your life. There's a way for you to share prayer requests, and we want to be able to pray for you. So if you'll take the time to do that, uh, it'll mean a lot to us, and, uh, and we'll definitely take the time, uh, whatever you share, uh, what's going on in your life. And part of being a church family, part of walking through life together is sharing those burdens and the things that are happening so that we can pray for each other. So uh, take the time to do that. We would really appreciate it. Last Sunday, we celebrated 59 years of God's goodness and faithfulness to our church. And uh, what an awesome celebration it was. And we took some time to look back and just thank God for what he's done. And then we took time to look forward and, and looking ahead with expectation and, and hope what God is going to do in the future. And that's what it's all about. It's about moving forward in faith and with courage. God is going to continue to work uh, in this place. Pastor Tony started this sermon series, Made for This, talking about how God has us in this place for this moment and this time. And I thought about that uh, this morning as we were getting ready for the services. Why, why do we have that confidence? Why can we be, uh, why can we have courage? Why can we have faith? Why can we have that kind of assurance that God is going to do the work that he said he would do? Because we have a good and faithful Savior, a Savior who's powerful, a Savior who can continue to save and change people's lives like he always has done. And so we want to sing about that this morning. So I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing this song, Blessed Assurance. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? He is worthy of our worship, and, and we can depend on him because that's who he is. So let's sing together. Savior, dwell on that. Oh, what a Savior. What a Savior, Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Wonderful Jesus. Oh, what a Savior. Wonderful Jesus. Wonder 
a thought that is. Jesus is mine. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you for the gospel. What a foretaste of glory divine. We worship you. We thank you for this reminder of how we are to live every day of the week in this spirit of praise, thankfulness, worship, trust. After all, you are holy forever. Cannot wait for the day when we sing to you in heaven, but help us to live that heaven life here on earth. Give us grace. Thank you for the worship of God's people. Bless us as we continue. In Jesus' name, amen. I've got a simple question for you. Does anyone here know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? That song, when we sing that, I mean, like... It's like, you're saying to God, this is my story. I mean, it's not just what he did on the cross. You're identifying with, that is my story. The cross is your story. And I, I know for some, they don't get that. But Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. And I, I'm, I'm going to preach my regular message, I promise. I'm like, but I got a message before there, okay? Listen to this. Every sin, past, failure, mistake, whatever, when you look at the cross and you see that my cross is, is the, was my cross, was Jesus' cross, because that's my story. My sin, my past, died on the cross with Jesus. So therefore, when we sing songs like that, we get excited because that is my story. I am alive even though I should be dead. And we, we have so much to praise God about. So don't hold back when we get into that. When we talk about that, hey, that is my story. That's not just words what we say. That is a testimony of being changed in Jesus Christ. So powerful. Take your Bibles to the book of Acts. And while you're turning there, I have a couple of announcements. Just if you're part of our kids' uh, worship, our kids' nursery, our kids' check-in, <clears throat> the Iwana program, or anything dealing with kids, uh, we have a really important meeting uh, that we do training, put everybody on the same page, and make sure that we're uh, geared up and ready to go. Uh, kids need to be grounded in the Word of God. And it's not going to happen in school. It's not going to happen on social media. We bring them to the, the church to be able to be educated, and we take that very seriously. And so if you're here and you're part of that ministry, we're going to ask you to take part of this luncheon that is October 5th at 11 a.m., <clears throat> and we're going to take time just to gear up and be ready to do our job and to do our very best as we teach the, the kids the gospel. And, and we have a way of doing that. We want to make sure that we're doing that. Sometimes we get so busy saying, oh, I don't need to be part of that. You miss out on the training, and this is so vital for us as a church. And then we are um, going to do something. Uh, I've been meeting with the trustees for a while with the transition of Pastor Dave coming out and, and moving up to Brunswick. He was moving out of his house. A lot of you know this, that Pastor Dave has lived in one of the houses that was part of his salary package uh, that he had at the church with a house that is across the street. Uh, and we've had that as a parsonage. We just, just a different era today. Uh, a, a lot of our pastors would rather come here, have their own house, rather than kind of renting from the church and things like that. And so after a number of years of discussing it, we have decided to sell the property across the street. Uh, and so we're going to be doing that in the next couple weeks, and we need to vote on that as a church. So we're calling for a special business meeting next Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock. That gives us time to get out of here and have lunch, but also time to get that taken care of before we have life group, because a lot of us have life group on Sunday night. And so the sale of the house, if it gets voted on, all that money and the proceeds is going to go on the remodel project that we just did. And, and so that's going to cut down on that and help us in multiple ways if we keep it. I don't want to keep it empty. We don't want to rent. Okay, just to put that out there, we don't want to rent. I don't want to be a landlord. The church does not want to be a landlord. Uh, it was different when it was one of our pastors and things like that. Uh, but this is, this is just a good move for us. And so if you have any questions about that, let me know. Uh, we're going to make it a, 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 the church aware of what's going on first before it does hit the market. And so we'll let you know all the details of that. And so, uh, But we need to have this meeting uh, next Sunday afternoon. So if you're an active church member, uh, in, uh, that includes you. So please be here. It's not required, but it is encouraged. Um, 
it's, it's fun looking at the beginnings of things. You know, when I grew up, uh, we didn't have a Walmart. Can you imagine? We didn't have a Walmart. <clears throat> and guess what I had instead of a Walmart growing up? Who could guess? Throw it out at me. We had Kmart. That's right, the big K, baby. That's, that's where we did all of our shopping. And, and now that's not even a thing. I'm curious, when I was a kid, Kmart's not a thing anymore, is it? It's not a thing anymore. How many of you remember Kmart, though, as part of your life? All right. I was just about to say that they would roll around that light. It's so cheesy now to think about. When there was a sale, they would turn on the blue light. And it was a blue light special. And that became part of our, part of our language. We would joke about things and stuff. Where did you get that? A blue light special or whatever? That's where it came from. It, wasn't, it was uh, part of our culture growing up. Walmart came in, knocked out Kmart, okay? Uh, they were the big dogs. Do you know Walmart's not the big dog anymore? Who can tell me who the big dog is now? Amazon is the big dog now. Amazon has 1.5 million employees. 1.5 million. And I, I, don't, I have it in my notes. I looked up at this earlier, and don't quote me on this, but I think last year, if I remember right, there was something. I'm not joking about this. There was something like $567 billion in sales through Amazon. Billion dollars. Now, I'm not upset about that because I, I, I mean, I, I'm a big part of that number. Not a big part of that number. <laughs> Some of you are like, he's, he's overpaid. He's overpaid. No, I'm not, I'm not saying, but I'm telling you, I'll go into a store and I will, before I shop and buy that, I will actually look it up on Amazon first to figure out how cheap it is. And you say, well, that's inconvenient. Not with Amazon. Now, with Amazon, now you can click on it and say, would you like this this afternoon? I'm like, yes, I would. I'd like that this afternoon. I, I get my ring doorbell going off because they'll deliver at like 5 o'clock in the morning to where I have whatever I had ordered sitting at my door the next day. It's a convenience. Huge corporation, huge thing. But if you go back to the origins, if you go back to the beginning of it, this is it. Not that, but this. <laughs> That's it. Guy named Jeff had an Bezos. He Jeff had an idea, and he was like, with this ongoing uh, thing of everybody doing going online and stuff like that. He said, "There's something to this." Do you guys know when he first started selling? It was a book uh, website, and it caught on, and people have the idea of what it is. And that sign is still hanging up that he like spray painted. And they say that that picture is a big deal for them because it keeps them grounded to their roots. It didn't start with all the apps. It didn't start with the giant warehouses. It didn't start with the 1.5 million. It started with him having a principle that people can order online, have it shipped to their house, and it was a convenience of that. He said in a lot of testimony of anybody that's growing a business like that, we don't want to get so far removed from our roots that we forget where we came from or how we started. And I think this happens in church, and I know I said a lot of this in the beginning of it when we had our introduction, a lot of this happens when we get so caught up in what church is, and you ask people, what is church? And we automatically associate church with being stained glass windows, and that was a big part of it. You saw the church that had stained glass windows, and it had a steeple on it, and, or, or it had a, uh, a, a big choir, or it had a big pulpit, or it had... It has uh, deacons meetings, and it has, you guys know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of things, but when you get to the beginning of it, not that anything of those are bad, because everything kind of grows, and you kind of associate the church with the steeple and things like that. I don't know why they did it. I know why they did it. The power of God was not found in any of those things. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the aspect of the things of it that we forget where it started. I, I want to bring you guys on a little journey through the Bible. I, I want to bring you guys to the beginning of this. Uh, there was, Jesus ascended back into heaven 40 days after he, his resurrection. Things were tough. When I think, say things were tough, when Peter ran and, and was denying Jesus, it wasn't because he was a wimp, okay? I, I want you guys to know that these were tough guys. But when you see them slam Jesus to the ground and rip his body to shreds, and I'm not trying to be gross, but I'm saying they ripped his body to shreds, there's something in us that say this is not good, and fear comes in. They, they were afraid. When Jesus was after the resurrection, do you know who they blame for the body being missing? 
They weren't running around saying, Jesus is alive. They were saying the disciples stole the body of Jesus. They were outlaws. They were rebels. They were wanted. They, they, they felt like the disciples were stirring up all this controversy and, and, and causing all these issues and things like this. And then if you get deeper into the book, we start learning in the book of Acts. You guys know what I'm talking about. When you start looking at the book of Acts, they took Stephen out for preaching the gospel. They picked up stones and they killed him. Saul goes on a rampage. He starts kicking in doors, burning churches. We was on his way, way to Damascus to destroy the church. It was not easy. It's not easy. We get into this passage and sometimes we're like, whoa, look what God did, but things are so bad today. And things were really bad then. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the former treatise that is the book that he wrote from Luke about the gospel. He said, oh, Theophilus, I wrote to you once before. I'm going to write to you again of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Till the day which he was taken up after the, through the Holy Ghost had had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. He's given the kind of the history there. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. That's why we call it the passion of the Christ by any, many infallible proofs. Being seen 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. They didn't even know what that was. But I can tell you that they were, they were waiting for something to happen. They were anticipating because the, the word promise there literally means a guarantee by God that I'm going to do something or keep doing something. And when they got into the upper room, they weren't just like, now what are we going to do? No, they were seeking after the promise of God. It's in verse 5. It said, for John truly baptized with water. You saw God do a great work through his, through his ministry, but you shall be baptized literally with the Holy Ghost not many days. That was literally talking about their lives would be fully changed and immersed in the working of the Spirit of God. It says, verse 6, when they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will at this time restore the kingdom of it to Israel? And he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons for the Father but, but, uh, but in his own power. He literally said, it's not yet. And they were all worried about that part of it. And Jesus said, I am going to come again. I'm going to fulfill my promises. But you have a job to do. It's a job that seems to be almost mission impossible. Over the top complicated. Before he explains the job, he says this. He said, but ye shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we had spoken these things while they beheld. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And when they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, steadfastly, literally, they were just like you can imagine. Here's Jesus in front of them in that spirit form and he ascends up into heaven and they're just standing there going, whoa, what is going on? They, as he went up, they didn't stop staring, literally to the point where uh, we, we, we see it, and they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, and two men stood by them in white apparel and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand gazing and gazing into heaven? The same Jesus which was taken up for you into heaven, so come in like manners, you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus is coming back. They, they, they didn't understand fully what was going to happen after this. They, they didn't understand what, what was just given to them, what they were about to do, that they were made for such a time as this. And they returned to Jerusalem about, uh, called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, the Sabbath day journey, which is about three quarters of a mile. You can imagine the conversation as they got together. Conversation that they're talking about. You can imagine hearing this. It's like you're going to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. And Peter, James, and John, and all those guys were together, and they're like, he said we're going to be witnesses, and they're like, dude, witnesses, we can't even leave the room. I'm telling you, guys, it, we're, we're risking our lives even to be walking out of this building right now. One of them speaks up and says, you, he didn't just say in Jerusalem, he said in Judea. He's like, guys, we can't travel. And in the uttermost parts of the earth, 
How in the world is that ever going to be possible? Have you ever faced something that just seemed utterly impossible? I'm going to skip what actually happens. And then we're going to close with that. But I want to take you on a journey of what happens in the midst of the accusations, in the midst of the persecution, with them being hunted as outlaws, revival breaks out. Does anybody know what I mean by revival? I'm talking about, and maybe we've been far removed from that, revival is related in the Bible often is like a fire. It's where the Spirit of God begins to work in such a way that it begins to do a work that's far beyond what man can get credit for. It, it, revival is when people begin to get saved, and it's not through manipulation of people. It's not a matter of scaring them through a story or, or singing 25 verses of an invitation song or, or say, repeat after me, or, or, or trying to twist their arm into belief. And I'm saying that we've all been part of that, but I'm telling you, as the Word of God went out, they began to receive the Word of God, and as they received the Word of God, there was power, there was power in the midst of that, and as the power of God was working, lives were being changed. I want to I want to just go on a spiritual journey. Peter's preaching the gospel on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, verse four, uh, 41. Turn the page or wherever you have to do to get there with me. And, and if you'll follow along in your Bible as we go through this and, and even if you want to take notes, I want you to see this. Take notes of what's going on. And you, just so you know, opposition is real and powerful in the midst of this. These people that were once chanting crucify him the people that were not believing that jesus was the son of god then they gladly received his word and were baptized the same day they were added unto them about three thousand souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers listen to this verse 43 this is so powerful and it says and fear came upon every soul that fear was literally a great awe, a respect of God, and an acknowledging of God upon every one of them. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. The same people, you think about how, ama how amazing this was. The same people that were standing there before saying, he, he's a fake and a phony and he needs to die, are now one by one as they hear the word of God and the spirit of God is working in that room. And I think sometimes we've gotten so far removed from understanding the working of the spirit of God. But something began to happen to where one by one, tears begin to flow and conviction begin to hit their hearts. I don't know who was the first one in that group, but somebody was like, I, I, I want to I know that Jesus and another one and another one until there was 3,000 people that accepted Christ on that day. And it wasn't Peter because he was a dork that stuck his foot in his mouth and kept making mistakes. It wasn't Thomas and the power of Thomas because he's the one that doubted that, he, that Jesus even resurrected. It wasn't in the power of them, but God began to shake and open their eyes. It wasn't emotional hype. It wasn't gimmicks. It wasn't dragging people to the altar. And I, I think a lot of us crave this. Wouldn't you love for your child that is wayward from God to come to you and say, man, I don't know what hit me, but I'm telling you, I know that I'm lost and I need God in my life. Wouldn't it be awesome to see our generation bow the knee at altars to where we had to extend the service because so many people were praying, getting their lives right? Wouldn't it be awesome if, if the addictions that were broken in our church started happening because of a church service of God getting a hold in their eyes, whispering to the ears that I am the greater power. Remember Acts 1, 8, and 1, 8, you will receive power of the Holy Ghost to change your lives. I'm asking you, have we gotten so far removed from seeing a move of God that we look at it as history and not the promise of God? I think there's a lot of things that we see on TV and a lot of made-up hype and stuff like that that kind of scares us so much that we, even as Baptists, get nervous about talking about the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God is the presence of God, and it's still real, and it still works. I said, it wasn't always easy. I know it wasn't, but watch this. Acts chapter 4, let's move forward. Let's stay on this journey together. 
And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They hated this. They gathered around, literally getting all the leaders together, saying they're preaching that message again. Where are they at? Where are they at? I'm going to shut them down. We're not going to have those lies. We don't want a bunch of radicals thinking that Jesus is still alive. Well, they're preaching it, not for long. And they laid hands on them, put a hold of them, arrested them till the next day, for it was now evening time. They were arrested. Let me tell you guys, just because we do the right thing doesn't mean Satan's going to stop. We're still going to face opposition. It's still going to be hard. Acts chapter 4, verse 4, how be it? <laughs> it's like, oh, wait a minute, don't stop there. Uh, the, the writer of Luke was saying, oh, that's not the full story. How be it? That, that's another way of saying, however, many of them heard the word and believed. <sighs> Fellowship Baptist Church, let me tell everybody watching online, <laughs> how be it? The opposition, the world, the, the distractions could not stop the word of God from working. I believe it is spiritual warfare for us to get in our heart and mind to say, well, God just doesn't work that way anymore. And the, the works in the days of Billy Graham and Billy Sunday. And, and, you know, we have all these stories of the great revivals and all that. You know, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I've got to stop. Many of them heard the word and believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Well, I'm going to ask you guys, what in the world made this happen? How is this possible? Listen to this, chapter 5, verse 14, okay? Staying on this journey together. And believers were more added to the church, and the multitudes, both of men and women. Now, I'm going to show you something that something's transitioning in chapter 5 to chapter 6. As they were getting saved, now the ones that were getting saved were now going out and telling people about Jesus. Because when God does a work in your life and God fires you up and you see the truth for yourself, it does something powerful in your life. You can't keep it to yourself. I think sometimes when we get so comfortable hearing the story and knowing the story that we get callous to the power of the story. Remember, this is my story. This is my song. We get excited about that. Chapter 6, verse 7, here's where the change happens. And the word of God increased. It wasn't programs. It wasn't, and I'm not against programs and things, but I'm telling you, it was the word of God that was spreading. And the number of the disciples no longer were added in Jerusalem, but the Bible used the word multiplied. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The church was spreading. People were being changed. And the gospel was multiplying because now the ones that were saved were helping people to be saved, that were helping people to be saved. That was the plan from the beginning. You don't have to turn there. Let me show you one last. By the time we get to the book of end of Acts, it says in Acts 17, verse 6, And these that have turned the world upside down, Literally, the reputation of them at the end of it, the, the, everybody that was the opposition was like, how are we doing? Are you kidding me? These radicals, we've arrested them, we've stoned them, we've burned their churches, we've burned their houses down. How are we doing with this? Are you kidding me? They're turning the world upside down. That's literally the quote that they had about the disciples. Now, I, I'm going to ask you guys, just help me out here. I, I know that there is different times that God works in different ways and things like that. But I'm going to just straight up ask you guys at Fellowship Baptist Church, okay? I, I believe that you're here because you love God, you have your Bibles, you care about the truth. Is revival still possible today? Yes, it is. Do we truly believe that God could still do great things? Yes. Now I know that as we get near the end that the Bible says that there will be a great falling away. And we're going to be anticipating that because there's a lot of things that are going to change. But I'm telling you, as for the word of God going out and the spirit of God working and people getting their hearts right and people walking through the door saying, I've been around it. I want some of that and their lives being changed. Is that possible? You know where I'm going, right? What's missing? 
I don't serve a God of just great potential. He's a God of action. Have we gotten so used to it not happening that we're okay with it not happening? Have we got so caught up in what we call church that we don't know what church was then? I'd imagine if you were to ask Peter and like, Peter, wow, tell me again. Okay, that next time, man, I was there, opposition on every side. Man, they, they were gathering outside. They wanted me to stop and they wanted to shut down the gospel. Did you know me? I'm telling you, something stopped them. And I got up there and I preached. Were you scared? Man, I was scared. But man, something took over and the word of God began to be preached. And when I saw people that were chanting for us to get out of the city, get their lives right, man, I knew that something real was happening. Peter, how did it start? Peter, I, I'm, I'm asking you, God made you that promise. But how did this all come to, to how did this happen? He says, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, but you shall receive power. Did you know what that meant? I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. I, I just know that it was a promise. Do you know the Bible has given us the promise that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Do you know the Bible made us a promise that I'll be the same yesterday, today, and forever? Did you know that God has made us a promise that the word of God will never return void? Do you know we have the promise that the word of God is quick and sharp and, and, and sharper than any two-edged sword and, and, and goes out and it does what he wants it to do and it comes back accomplishing the will of God and I have it right here. I have it right here. I'd ask Peter, is there more? Take me to the beginning. How did it start? And Peter would be like, well, you know the story. We left Jesus on his Sabbath day journey. Verse 13, and we were all come in. We went up into an upper room, and there abode Peter and James and John. Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the brother of James. It was all continued with one accord in prayer. How did it start? We all continued in one accord in prayer. I know this is the most basic message and everybody's like, oh, all that hype up and you just left us with, they all started with prayer. It says, and supplication, the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with the brethren. They, they were gathered together and, and the Bible literally says they were in one accord. That, that's the unity of the church. It wasn't just somebody and God had a plan from the very beginning when he called Peter, James, and John and all the disciples together. He was assembling a group of people because God loves the unity of the family of God. And it was not just a matter of that they sang. I know that they sang. It wasn't just a matter of they talked about the word of God. They had the word of God. It wasn't just a matter that they fellowship because they broke bread. It wasn't just a matter that they encouraged each other because they edified the body. It was a matter at the beginning of it. Peter would acknowledge to you that it all started by us bowing the knee, lifting up our heads towards God and saying, we can't do this, please help. They continued in prayer. Let me break this down into two simple points. And this is straight from what this verse says. Number one, we must recognize our need. It's, it's saying this here that... Uh, that they are the body of Christ, that, that they are the church. They didn't know what that meant. And it says that they began these things according, in, uh, the, and they all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, I know that word supplication almost gets left off to the side, like, well, they con continued in prayer. That was the important part. But what about the supplication part? It's a root word that means to plead humbly. It's a word that means brokenness or a cry or a plea. It is telling God that I can't do this. It, it, there's a difference between praying, and let me tell you, we can say that we're a praying church because a lot of times when we pray, 
It's a matter of us starting off like, Lord, we need help, and Lord, we need this to increase, or we want more people, or we, we want my kid changed, or all these different things that we say, because that is what praying is. We know that. The Bible says ask. So we're just good at, hey guys, listen, we're good at asking. But that's not how it started. As they begin to explain that we're going to go out and do all these different things, they begin to say, guys, there's no way that we can do this. Guys, can I tell you, us as a church, everything that I'm saying when it comes to revival, there is no way for us to do this. Do you know how many things that are in our life that there is no way that you can do it? You can't open your kids' eyes to see that they need Jesus. You can't. I can't preach a message and see the lost come to know Jesus. I can't do it. I can't reach in the heart and mind of somebody that has an addiction and make them convicted that the power of God is the only thing that can change them. I can't change a nation that has uh, all, all these things going in the wrong direction. I can't do it. So the supplication was this. I want you guys to get this. When the Bible talks about humbling yourself before God, their beginning of this was not necessary. Lord, give us more and do more. It was this. They bowed the knee, literally broken before God, and literally said, we can't do this. We try to add God to what we do. We have the plan. We have the agenda. We have the order of service. We have the program. We have the ministry team. We have our schedule. We have our bank account. We have our 401k. We have all those things. We work our plan, and then when things get rough, we go over there and say, Hey, we need to stop and pray. Why is that? This is going rough. We need God to help us with this. God, come over here and help us with our plan. But the supplication of the church is literally the plea of bowing our knees before God, saying, we can't do this without you. There is no power in the physical action of me bowing my knee before God. It is a reflection of my heart. And let me guys tell you, a lot of times when we say, you know, fold your hand and bow your heads and all these things that we do. We go through the mechanics of these things. The aspect of that that we're trying to teach our kids or the principle we're trying to teach our kids with doing that is to show respect or humble ourselves. In the book of James, he said literally this. He said, humble yourself therefore in the sight of God and he shall lift you up. Yes. You know, in, in, in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, when he was talking to the church, and he said, ask, seek, and knock, and all those different things. If my people were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Do we skip the beginning of it when he says, humble themselves and pray and seek my face? The beginning of this is literally God saying to every one of us that I have a problem in our marriage, or problem with our kids, or problem with our nation, or asking God to do a great work, or even on a Sunday before God says that I'm going to see people get saved, I'm going to see lives change, I'm going to see the impossible happen. God's people literally just stops and says, and it won't happen without you because you are the source of the power. So therefore, we put our agendas on hold and we ask you to do it. If the sin at the beginning of mankind happened with the pride of Satan, that's what happens in life so often is we get so caught up in what we do that we leave God out to the point where we get more upset about something changing in the church that deals with a tradition that we get upset about they're going through a service where somebody didn't get saved. It wasn't just the supplication. Let me take you to the second part. We must be a church that recognizes our need. We must be a praying church. I know this is obvious, and it says in Acts 1.14, it says, these all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. So the foundation of the beginning of the church before they ever went out witnessing, before they ever had a lectern, before they ever had a choir or, or a drum set or a cello or anything like that, before ever they had chairs or pews, before they had lobbies and security teams, at the root of it, the, 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 the garage beginning of Amazon, the, the, the garage beginning of the church, was ju them just gathered around saying, do you guys remember what Jesus said? Do you remember when Jesus told us the beginning of his ministry and the disciples talking and says, yeah, what did he do? He said that he went into the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights and fasted and prayed. That's how he started. 
Every time you see Jesus doing something, even when the disciples were out in the water and, the, and Jesus came walking on the water, can, who can tell me what happened? What was Jesus doing before he walked on the water? He was praying. When the disciples were gathered around, they were talking about God doing a work. They literally said, Lord, teach us to pray. How often is scripture that everything that even Jesus himself did, before God did a great work, you find Jesus himself praying. He goes to the cross to tackle sin for us before he was beat on the cross, before he was beat with the nine tails uh, uh, and, and all the things that he went through. What did Jesus do? He gets up from the fellowship of the believers. He goes to the garden. He falls on his face and he does what? He prayed. Have we missed that? Do we get so busy with our activities and our events that before we go to do something, we'll, we, and, and I know I've said this so many times before, we'll stop everybody and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's pray really fast before we get started. It's almost like we've got our agenda, but I know we're supposed to pray. The teaching of Jesus when it came to prayer, he said these words, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. That was the teaching of Jesus. But when they said that they continued in prayer in that passage and they continued in supplication, that is an aggressive pursuit. That is them running after this to such a point where if God said, I'll give you power, they were in their mind, I'm not leaving till I see something happen. And I'm telling you, this has to come from our hearts. It, it's not just a schedule thing. It has to come from our hearts where we as a church say, God promised to do a work. God promised his power would be with us. God promised to change lives. I'm not going to stop asking till I see it. I'm not going to stop seeking till I find it. I'm not going to stop knocking on heaven's door. Literally, if you needed something and somebody had it, this is the knocking. It's literally, now tell me when it gets irritating. Good, I'm going to keep going. Sound like a broken record, but hear me out. I, I, I grew up my whole life in church. My whole life. My whole life has been in church. Whole life. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I thank God for the, the life that I have. I've learned a thing or two about God. I've, I've sang the songs. How great is my God, how awesome is my God, how faithful is my God, how good is my God. I've preached the messages for 24 years. I, I, I taught Sunday school when I was in college. I went through all those things. I've told all the different aspects of it. I've done it myself. I've been part of this my whole life, my whole life. And then my son gets cancer. And it's so bad, it's like that impossible level. It's so messed up. Then God calls back to my mind, and I'm battling with, is this real or is this not? Can he intervene in such a way to turn this around? And I probably had more times of thinking that it wasn't going to happen than it was going to happen. But I preached one time on a Sunday morning about ask, seek, and knock. And it was just a matter of if there was the seeking of God's hand at work, it's a matter of I don't stop seeking until I find it. And I'm like, God, if you're the one that can intervene and do this, I'm not going to stop pursuing it. I'm not going to stop knocking or asking until something changes. And God did that for me with Logan. And God did that for us with Logan. But isn't the principle just as true with revival in the church? Isn't it just as true seeing our young people 
that are struggling and our young adults and the addicted and the older people and the grandparents that feel alone and the elderly that are feel going through depression. All, all of us that we're going through this, isn't it just as true that God today could step into that? But a lot of times we bow our knee and like, God, I need this. And then the next day it's like, where are they at? They're not saying a word, God, what in the world? But what if we knew that God could do something in this generation? What if it was in our heart and mind that God could bring revival and bring life change and, and break addiction and convict our heart and make it to where we didn't have a song service, we had revival on Sunday morning? You say, there's more to it than prayer. You don't leave out the Spirit of God. Come back next Sunday. Because you're absolutely right. That was the partnership between the praying of the church and the working of the Spirit of God that worked together to make this happen. There's a verse in Jeremiah. He said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Call unto me. Seek the face of God and ask him. This isn't just a message to the church. It's a message to every mom and dad. When is the last time they were so broken over your kids or your problem or whatever that you shut the door, bowed the knee, and sought the Savior? When's the last time that we ripped up the schedule and just have a call to prayer? When's the last time that we just get in life group and instead of saying, oh, well, let's not leave before we pray, that we just take half the time and just pray. When's the last time that we just spontaneously say, meet me at the church on Friday night and let's just pray? Do you guys hear me? If that is the catalyst to make everything happen, then that has to be the priority of the church. But we determine whether we had a good Sunday or not is if I like the song, if the preacher went long or short. You know what I'm saying? It's like we, we our, our, our measurements of success are so way off. And then we get to the point where we're like, well, church isn't what it used to be. No, we're not what we used to be. Supplication is literally us as a church saying, we can't do this without you. And I need your help. And the prayer of the church was us just lifting up our hand towards heaven and saying, we want to see the promises of God. We want to see you work. It's a craving of seeking till I find it, till I don't stop praying until God shows up to do something. So we're going to pray and we're going to sing. And whether you're watching online, listening to podcasts, or sitting in this room, I challenge you, if you want to come pray, if you want to sit and pray, but I'm just asking you this week to bow the knee. Bow the knee before God and say, you know why this isn't happening right? Because I'm not asking you. And I think that I've got it all figured out. Let's pray. God, I know, Lord, that this is the key to this. Lord, they didn't see the multitude saved. They didn't see all the people that were cheering for them to die and now bowing their head in salvation. Lord, all of these things that happen, happen, Lord, at the, the core of this, of just your people, young and old, men and women, on their knees before God, praying to an almighty God for your help. So God, may this be the beginning of us understanding that we are made for this. And it's not because of our programs, our buildings, or our our, our ideas, it's, it's because that we bowed our knee admitting that we can't do this without you. So Lord, take over this time. Help us to experience your spirit working in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and sing with me? You just respond as God leads. The biggest thing is just pray. Praying for the breakthrough. You say, it can't happen. No, no, no. Unto Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the earth, God proved to them that could happen because revival I broke out. This is a song I of confession. Confess, bowing here, I find my rest without you. Listen to these words. I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart.
so teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my my request. It's not a request, it's a challenge. I don't think they even knew what they were doing. Have you ever been in that place like, Lord, I, we don't know what we're doing. They didn't walk out of there with a plan. They, they didn't know if they were going to live or die. But I know that it started with them just simply doing what they were taught to do, of bowing the knee and asking God. So this is my challenge or my request to you this week. What if we just did this week different? Whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, whatever, that you pick the time to shut the door, park the car, slip away, and get alone. And if possible, bow the knee. And I'm, I'm not saying that the magic comes from the bending of the knee. But I'm talking about just humbly coming before God, saying, God, our church is in a place that Winchester Pike now is being cleared left and right for houses and apartments to be built. Did you guys know that we were made for this? We, we, we have the food pantry because the economy is so crazy and people are struggling. We have the food pantry because we're made for this. We're going to do more with our online. We're going to talk about more stuff next Sunday morning or Sunday evening in the uh, business meeting, things like that. Because we are created by God to step in with the power of God and the power of prayer to make a difference today. We can either sit around and complain about it saying God's not working or we can bow the knee and say you still can work if we'd still just seek the face of God and humbly ask him and just be obedient to the things that God has demonstrated for us to do. Let's pray. God, help us, Lord, to be faithful, consistent, and one accord to pray. God, I ask, Lord, that the Word of God will go with us and convict us, Lord, and, and, and change our week. But we'll take time, Lord, to seek the face of God, to humbly ask and seek and knock for revival, for life change, for addictions to be broken, for the prodigals, Lord, that we all have in the back of our mind that we want to see come back to you. Lord, for the service to be taken over by the Spirit of God to where you begin to work in the hearts and minds in a way that illustrations and screens and just all the things that we put emphasis on, Lord, that you do the work and not us. So God, help us, Lord, as we are about to leave Lord, to take this truth with us into our week. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. It's been great to be in church, and I just have a couple things here before you take off. Uh, the first one is uh, this past week, uh, life groups really got going full swing. A lot of, Some of our groups met through the summer, but 
Uh, a lot of them had summer breaks, and, and so starting last Sunday and through this week, a lot of our groups uh, got fired up, and we're so grateful for that and thankful for uh, the opportunity that it is to be able to grow together in the Word and to grow together in our understanding of God's Word and get connected with people. And so if you are not connected yet with a group and you need to be, uh, come see me at Connecting Point. Um, you want to know more about the options and things and ways that you can be involved. It's 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 makes such a difference as we're as we're trying to follow Jesus, coming alongside people who we can just do life with together and grow with together and uh, and just share the real stuff together. So, uh, life groups. If, you, if you're not connected, take some time. Uh, come see me. Reach out online and uh, go to the church center app. You can see all the groups. But any questions that we can answer, we want to be able to do that. Uh, one thing coming up in the next few weeks that we just want to continue to get on your radar is we're offering a financial. Peace Peace University, a, a class that can help you as you manage your finances, help you uh, to be a better steward, and uh, maybe some things you didn't know you can learn and grow in this area. We're offering this class completely free, and it's happening on Sunday nights starting on October 6th. It's going to be in the fellowship hall starting at 4 o'clock on Sunday nights. And so if that's something you're interested in, you can sign up using the Church Center app. You can also, uh, there's a table in the lobby, in the Welcome Center lobby. You can utilize that. Um, our church offers uh, access to a an app called Ramsey Plus, which is part of Financial Peace University. And there's a ton of resources on Ramsey Plus. That's available to you as well. You don't have to be part of the class to have access to that. You can uh, stop by Connecting Point if you want to know more information about that. But a great way to be a good steward, glorify God with our, our resources. And so we want to encourage you about that. Uh, there are several other things that are happening, uh, September, October. Uh, you can see them all in the Church Center app. If you have questions about anything or there's things that we can help you with or pray for you about, call the office during the week. Uh, we want to be there for you. So uh, make sure you take advantage of those opportunities. It's been a great day. Have a great afternoon. You're dismissed.